thank you to the panelists and all of you who have signed on to this event. It, um, it's often said that theology is a, a lonely uh, project, um, but I have found in fact that it is a time of, of profound fellowship and support and nurture. And this panel is such a, a beautiful example of that kind of theological fellowship, uh, of um, deep and thoughtful exchange on the deep things of God. Um, and I feel um, built up and encouraged. Uh, and this is one of the, the great gifts that you've given me in the center and all of you on the panel have given me. And I, I want to publicly acknowledge that. Uh, a word or two about the, um, the, the purpose, the, um, the major architectonic of this volume. Uh, and I will uh, try to be brief so that the panelists can raise questions and the, the complexity of this project can become uh, more clearly seen through their questions and some of my responses. My, my major aim here is to ask all of us in the church what the dogma of the Holy Trinity is about, what its, its fundamental thema, its question is. I, I think um, for many of us raised in the church um, and uh, catechized in uh, the church, we think of the Trinity as principally a doctrine about three persons and one nature. And the, um, the quest for us as um, believers in God, in the one God, is how these three are one. Now, I don't think that this is false by any means, but I think it's not the fundamental question in Trinity. And uh, what I, I aim in this uh, volume to do is to explore another framework for considering the mystery of Trinity. Uh, this, this volume is, is dedicated, offered um, as a reflection on the inner life of God. So I'm, I'm not uh, thinking about the way God is manifest in uh, saving um, spiritual power and presence through the incarnation and the outpouring of the spirit. I'm thinking instead about the inner structure of God. Uh, and my, my claim here is that the fundamental question we are to explore, to, to reflect upon, to rest in, in the dogma of the Holy Trinity is the processional life of God. Uh, this I take to be one of the fundamental truths that Israel's scriptures teaches us, that God is living. And to reflect on the life of God it is to consider the way in which uh, God is not, not not a structure, not inert, uh, not simply ideal, though of course immaterial, um, but that God's very nature is life. And this life, uh, Israel tells us, is holy. When we're thinking about the holy 
livingness of God. Now this, I think, as we reflect deeply upon it, leads us to the, the very heart of Israel's testimony about this living, holy God. And that is the sacrificial cultus as laid out in the book of Leviticus. Uh, this is described in uh, rabbinic texts as the uh, fiery heart of the Torah. And I, my, uh, my view that is unfolded in this volume is that the uh, inauguration and the continuation of the sacrificial practice, the um, uh, law code surrounding it, the figures involved in it, the relation between law and narrative is at a profound level, a reflection on the processional life of God, this livingness. So I, I try to develop the way in which God is self-offering, a self-offering God who receives back this offering. And we catch sight here of the um, generative processional life of God. And I, I argue that this is a, a unitary life that is also doubled. Uh, this is why we speak about two processions, but I think these are two processions in the sense that, that heat and light are um, two whole expressions of the element of fire. Uh, uh, the fire that emerges out of the sanctum and um, consecrates and sears the offering that Moses has laid on the altar at the inauguration of the sacrificial cultus. Th this, I, I believe, teaches us the way in which uh, fire as heat and light consumes and returns to its origin. And this is, I think, under Israel's idiom, the dogma of Trinity. Uh, my um, my um, treatment of the Old Testament, I think, is um, something that harks back to the fathers of the church, where the Old Testament was considered magistra, the teacher. And it was for that reason that it was principally Old Testament texts that were used in the argument about the eternal generation of the Son. And we can see that duplicated in the Cappadocian Fathers as they reflect on the procession of the Spirit. Now, this does not mean that the New Testament has nothing to say about Trinity and no part to play. Uh, it, it's my view that, that the New Testament, in, in one sense, says nothing new. That is, it confirms and consummates what we have learned from Israel's scriptures. But this consummation, the form of this consummation, is to give us names of this processional life. And this processional life is itself intellectual, alive, holy, good. Um, it is what we call personal. And we have names given in the letters of Paul, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, in a different way in the Gospel of John, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit. 
and in this way the um, the origin is given the the name of father the uh, the son uh, as the uh, self offering the father as offering and the, the spirit receiving uh, and consummating the whole and for this reason we call the spirit the holy spirit so processional life is principally this being caught up in the spirit this completion and consummation of the whole so um that's a, a um a very quick tour of um some of the aims and themes in the volume and i am eager to uh, hear what the panelists have to say okay well panelists you can feel free to jump in i know some of you had submitted questions beforehand uh, if you'd like to raise any of those or other things that came up in your responses um, you're welcome to now thank you uh so much for this just wonderful wonderful work to be honest i was reading it last month and i it was one of the first times in a while like this is why we read theology it was just such an engaging and arresting text and so uh, I'm thankful for that. I would say I commend you on writing such a great, but I'm thankful uh, for it. Um, and one question that I have had that's been uh, at nagging might be putting it too strongly, but even since your first volume is the mode of which you're writing. Uh, I've read some of your other work, your essay on finitude and sin, for example, in uh, the TNT Clark Companion. Mm -hmm. And I, the the mode of writing is is very different. And so I was wondering if you could unpack why the the style what you're what you're doing and uh, what you're hoping to accomplish mm -hmm. thank you it's such a discerning question thank you daniel i um no it took me a, a long time to find the right voice in which to write systematic theology in our day it's um it's vital i think that um, systematic theology be written in such a way that the um, surpassing beauty of the object of theology is exemplified in the text. Um, and this is something that I think as, as uh, theologians have moved further and further into the university and the university system, uh, there has been less and less expression, direct expression of. Um, so I, I tried a, a number of different styles um, to use in writing um, theology. And I, uh, of course, Bard, who has been one of the to, uh, doctors of the church for me was uh, an instructor in in how to how to express the, as a, a full resident of of his world something that was broader and deeper um, and energized by what he saw in scripture and I I hoped to do something like that. Um, now I think there, there needs to be analytic rigor in theology. It, it's, um, it's not, um, as I, I try to argue, it's not uh, all liturgy, it's not all praise, it's not all doxology, um, but the kind of um, mm, more, uh, academic analytic style that I sometimes use in um, handbook articles uh, or in essays, I think is, is not uh, fitting when we're attempting to actually address um, uh, God's um, addressing of us, which uh, is what I take theology to be. 
Dr. Zonder, I just I want to uh, join in thanking you for that too. I um I had read your works before. I had met you at the Bart Society and heard you present, but I, I remember the exact moment I first heard you speaking in this new voice. It was at a Los Angeles Theology Conference, mm -hmm. and you were presenting on Christology. Yeah. And I I was helping organize things, so I think I was trying to see if we had tablecloths ready for an evening event. And I was scampering around after you had been safely put at the front of the room and were in charge. But then I heard what you were saying and I just stopped in my tracks and thought, wait, that's that's different. Um, Kate Zonderegger has found a different voice here for the thing she's doing. So uh, that's been a wonderful breakthrough moment for the uh, for the practice of systematic theology in our time. So. Mm, thank you, Fred. I, I remember with such fond memories that inaugural uh, Logos um, um, theology conference and um, and it was um, an attempt to try out um, speaking dogmatically. Um, and it, it's such a long journey um, that, that you and I and all the panelists have been on to get through um, a, a kind of mastery of modern academic study of theology um, and how to how to incorporate that and to learn from it and still to speak dogmatically. It, um, that conference helped me um, try that out and thank you for noticing that. Professor Sonderegger, I, I'm a giant fan of both of these volumes and I think Fred said in his remarks that reading your work is, is suspenseful and I felt that way as well um, as the book unfolded. And I feel the suspense, especially when I think about you moving towards your Christology. I have some questions that came up in my written response as well about how the Christology might develop. And one question uh, related that came up as you were making your opening remarks is this question of situating the doctrine of the Trinity in the book of Leviticus and in the sacrificial cultus, as you say, and I was reflecting on how the sacrificial system is within the covenantal system, which suggests to me that there is insinuated in sacrifice a relationship with, of God with Israel. So I would love to hear you reflect a little bit on this question to center the doctrine of the Trinity in sacrifice. And perhaps reflect, help me reflect a little bit on my hesitation or my, my, my persistent need to cash that out in terms of persons. Um, I just, that's perhaps more a comment, but could you help me think through this a little bit, make a correction? Right, that, uh, no, that's it's so good. And I think a, a number of you have raised this point um, in your comments. And I think this, um, this is the strong um, counterexample to what I'm doing. Yes. I, I think there's, a, there's just a strong tradition of, um, of anchoring Trinity in persons and persons in a particular sense that is in the incarnation uh, and uh, uh, and perhaps um, say as someone like uh, like Tannenberg might do the um, the uh, existence of covenant um, or or von Rod a covenant as the um, pre-existence of the of the sun. I think that's the great um, counterstroke against what I'm trying to do here. Uh, and I, my, my worry about this development in Trinity is that it's been twinned with an epistemic focus on the economy and the claim, which is um, so central to Bart's work, um, that it is through Christology only um, that we gain access to the reality and 
uh, truth and uh, objectivity of God. Now that has had an effect, I think, of uh, joining the um, imminence and transcendence of God in such a way that uh, what I would call the processional life of God has been collapsed into the missions. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I think um, the, the, um, the counterstroke to the, well, the danger of this it is that the economy becomes conceptually necessary to the doctrine of Trinity. Um, we, we can see um, notions of um, super and subordination that are in Bard. Uh, it's it, in a, a number of modern treatments of Trinity that exist in the sun. This canonic movement in Philippians 2 is, is taken to be a description of the reality of uh, God himself. Uh, and I think that's emblematic of this uh, collapse of the processional life into the, uh, the missions. Um, so I, um, um, what I believe um, Israel's scripture is, is teaching us is that the um, a processional holy life of God is disclosed fully, not, not simply in, in anticipation, not simply as prelude, but uh, um, expressed and manifest fully in um, Israel's scripture, um, in the um, practice inaugurated under uh, Moses's um, priestly prophecy, um, and in the, uh, of course, the uh, covenant as it is um, hallowed and renewed by sacrifice. Um, now, I think if you if you hold a view like this. Um, then uh, Christology is a, a Trinitarian doctrine, not, a, not a, a foundation for Trinity, but itself an expression of Trinity, um, that is a, of the mission of the Son. And it confirms what we see in Israel's scriptures. That's a, that's a start anyway. That's, <laughs> it's really a deep and important question. Thank you. Could I um, maybe continue with that line just a little bit? I too am really grateful for uh, the volume, for your work, for your voice therein. Um, I'm thinking about uh, maybe, maybe I'm trying to push too far towards the persons again and, and not sitting with you um, in the processions, but I'm thinking about the way you talk about the father um, uh, as source and origin, right, of the, the processional life, and then the emphasis on uh, redoublement, uh, uh, which points us in a special way to the son and the spirit, I, I, I think. Um, and I guess I have two opposite questions about that. Um, if we emphasize the father as source in this way, um, does it inevitably lean towards the super and subordinationism that you're so rightly warning us against? Um, at the exact same time, um, does it make the father disappear in a certain way? Um, I assume there will be Christology and there will be pneumatology as you continue your work. Will there be more on the father or, or is this the father um, uh, in this volume? Um, and are there things to be said about uh, father beyond source and origin-ness? Um, 
I could keep going, but I'd love to hear you talk about that constellation of things. That's such a wonderful question, Beth. Yeah, we, we could spend just a, a week if, if Matt can just extend our seminar for a week, we, go, we can make progress on this. I, um, you know, uh, Jensen has that whole chapter on petrology um, and it, it's actually in uh, Bonaventure's discussion of the paternity of God that the redoublement, um, the doubling, uh, gets um, worked out. And the, there's kind of a parallel question in, in Thomas where, where father is used in, in a, a double sense. Um, I, I think, you know, to me, um, uh, Sarah Coakley is, is the great um, uh, uh, champion of, of the worry that you're expressing, that, that this, this idea of the, the um, origin or primacy of the father is fundamentally uh, subordinationist uh, to the, the other persons. Um, now, I, um, I mean, uh, Pache and, and Hale, Sarah Cookley. I, I, but I, I think, I think there is a place for Texas in, uh, the divine life. I think this is what we see in that inaugural sacrificial, um, movement of the fire out of the sanctum um, and uh, the sweet savor returning. There, there is a, an orderliness and an order uh, in the um, processional life. And that in, in one sense, the taxis is the discussion of the uh, processional life as personal. Uh, so it, there is origin, um, the um, initiation of this, this uh, consuming fire. Um, it, the fire itself, it is a self-offering. This is a, the way in which the son is the father in the mode of offering. It, this, I think, is, is what we're hearing in John 17. I think this is what it means to say, I and the Father are one. So that's, yeah, that's um, where I'm kind of heading in, in um, development of Christology. Um, but the significant thing is that the, the Spirit is the, the Sabbath rest, the self-sanctifying, the hallowing. So uh, the, the consummation, the return, is, I think, a, um, a way in which the, the father receives his fatherhood from the um, consummation of the spirit, uh, as well as from the son. And, and therefore, that um, the, the persons are not uh, subordinate, but, but in fact, confirming one another. That's, that's, a, that's a little Hegelianism in me uh, there, I think. Um, that's, a, that's a start on your wonderful question. Thanks. Um, Dr. Zondergar, since we have you here, I want to try to paraphrase something that you said and see if uh, you receive it as an acceptable paraphrase. I'm thinking about the approach that you set out here for reading Israel's scriptures um, and discerning in, in them processionality in the life of God. And then without rehearsing it all, the, the way you talk about the dawning of an aspect uh, and a, a Trinitarian reading of the Old Testament. W when I try to talk with people about this and, and kind of say what I think you're saying. It, it seems as if you could, as a Christian theologian, read Exodus and Leviticus um, with a Jewish person of faith, and you could both agree on certain phenomena that you were observing about the manifestation of God, 
And you can even describe it with many of the same words about procession and life, you know, some of the categories that are given there in scripture itself. But even some of your description of processionality and of going forth, but not going out of you know, self-sacrifice, all of that. Is it the case that you would have a large, um, a large set of affirmations, which both kinds of readers could nod their heads about and say, yes, we both see that this is what's happening here. And then you as the Christian theologian would say, and I see that as triunity. Yes, it um, beautifully said. So that's this dawning, this Wittgensteinian theme, the dawning of an aspect or, or the qua relation. Um, right. And then you could listen to the other reading, which is, which would be, I don't see this as Trinity, that that aspect is not one that has dawned on me. I see it in this other way, but it increases the, uh, this is the sort of non-supersessionist strategy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th this is a, an attempt, um, it, it's twofold. It's on one hand to um, say uh, that this reading of scripture might at first sound as though once again, Christians are laying claim to Israel scriptures and Christians are right and Jews are wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm instead um, uh, aiming to do the thing that you said so well, Fred, uh, to use the language, Israel's language and say, this, this is what we're talking about in Trinity. Um, but uh, Christians have developed a whole way in which we talk about these these very same biblical foundations uh, and so it is life as procession it is self-offering as eternal generation um, it is the um, uh, returning fragrant fire as the uh, hallowing holy spirit um, and I think ultimately this is what, well, this is one reading of Augustine's account of uh, illumination. So uh, if, you, if you take it in an epistemic form, um, uh, why it is that a particular idea becomes true for us and not for others, it is uh, the, the shedding of a, of a light in us that is not our own uh, and is not of our will um, and is simply this, this gift to see. Uh, and that I, I think that's an Augustinian move in the philosophical investigations uh, where you, you just, you see. It, it's not um, um, discursive, it's not foundational, um, it's not uh, evidential, it, it's um, a, a kind of intellection. It, that sounds like your, uh, your version of the sort of statement that the tradition would make, um, where Aquinas, for instance, would say, we can know the existence of God by reason operating properly, but the triunity of God is only by revelation. Mm -hmm but also a little bit like what you warned us off about in Bart, which is sort of, unless God speaks this word and makes himself known, we're sort of epistemically shut out from that knowledge. So that, that's a, it's a family of moves there? It, yeah, I, I think the, the Deus Dixit, I, I think, um, belongs to Israel's scripture in a full and robust way. I, uh, this, I, I see um, Bard acknowledging that from time to time, and he, he draws on Calvin well there, I think. Um, but often he writes as though Deus Dixit means the incarnation. And I, I think, I think this is not true to the full canonicity of Holy Scripture. It's, um, uh, the Old Testament has to 
has to be scripture for us, not, not background reading. And I, I think this is, this is um, a part of my, my attempt to, to try out how, how that might be. But I, I am, I, and many of you raised this supersessionist question, and I'm, I'm very sensitive to it, and I, um, and I'm hoping that this combination of moves, as you say so well, Fred, um, will will ward off the the worst of it. Um, but of course, always, always, this is this is something that. Um, uh, that um, Jews may read as a, another uh, colonization of this text. I had an, another question about the choice of governing images. Even in the in the Old Testament, I was um, after reading through the second time. I was wrestling with what do I do with some of these mountain images that we yeah, get in the yeah, Psalter. Yeah, that was such an interesting theme, Daniel, yeah. So if you could, un and I feel like the the Daniel on my right shoulder would say, and the sacrifice takes place on the mountain and God condescends to the mountain. So how does the selection of one theme uh, shape the project? And what do you think there would be differences if, if we were to talk about the mountainness of God? Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, it's um, yeah. In in uh, your comment, Daniel, you you just um, laid out some of the resonances of of mountain of, of um, strength of of a, a certain kind of um, immutability uh, of uh, the eternity of the everlasting hills. Um, I th I think. I think here is where uh, uh, tradition is is shaping me, and uh, this is a, a book that is is new but also old. I um, I I think I think we're we're seeing the way in which scripture um, has um, central and peripheral elements. Um, and this, just this is what uh, the, the Torah represents it, in scripture. And I think there's a particular way in which those five books have been read, um, received rabbinically, but also in the uh, church fathers. Um, and that is that there is a a centerpiece uh, of the Torah, and that is the uh, the, the law, and its uh, center in sacrifice. So I, I'm I'm receiving that, um, and trusting that that's that's the principal image, um, and I and that is is twinned with the disclosure um, of, of God and his name uh, to Moses in the burning bush. So um, those, those twins seem to me to, to point to the way in which um, fire and the fiery kabod of God uh, are central. Um, but it's true. I mean, think of uh, Gregory Nyssa and, and the life of Moses, that, that theme of ascent uh, that is so central, that's all predicated on, uh, on the, uh, the mountain, the moving up the mountain and Jeremy Taylor. It's, uh, so I just, I don't think it's, it's central, but it's clearly there. And it's one of the reasons we speak of transcendence, um, because it's it, it's moving upward. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. I'm wondering too how that might touch on um, 
other areas of the law which have a daily um a daily claim on the bodies of the people of God, food law and sexual purity law and uh, other pieces of the cultic practice. Um, how do those relate to the temple um, and reveal the holiness of God? Right. This is one of the uh, great questions about Christian reception of uh, Leviticus. It's um, you know, it has basically dropped out of modern discussion in, in part because of this um, desire early on by Christians to find categories uh, that, that govern the law so that there are some that are ceremonial and some that are moral. Um, some um, for the Federalists that belong to a, a particular period that then are superseded. Um, and, and these categories made the uh, law narrower and narrower so that the Decalogue really becomes the, the only living remnant of, of the law in much uh, Christian piety. Um, I, th I think I think scripture is to be received in a in a different way than um, by attempting to uh, divide up the Torah into categories that allow us to see which things fall away and which abide. I I think instead uh, we're to see the whole as a, a way in which Israel is being um, sanctified from its defilements um, and that the, um, the sin and guilt that are part of the covenant people are purged so that the the um, twin events of the uh, apostasy with the golden calf and the defilement of the alien fire are, are being um, constantly hallowed and sanctified in the uh, cultus. Now, uh, Christians, I think, um, receive this and read this, I think, uh, according to um, our own um, practice of the faith. So uh, some of this is expressed in our liturgy and, um, and particularly in liturgical churches like my own, um, this, this sense of, of sacrifice, um, of uh, holiness, of defilement, um, of uh, ritual purity, all of this gets expressed in the, um, the uh, rite of the Holy Communion and the way in which it's practiced and baptismal liturgies or, or in other sacramental acts. Um, and the uh, uh, sense of the uh, reception of uh, the whole body being the indwelling of the temple as, as um, that the body is a temple of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As Paul says, this is also reception, I think, of the Levitical tradition. So um, what I, what I want to suggest is that um, uh, Christians have a particular way of, of receiving Leviticus, and it, it should be um, a receiving of the whole under um, Christian um, practice, observance, liturgy. Um, and uh, from my point of view, um, scripture is to be read in a, a census plenier style um, in the um, the full sense of scripture, 
Um, and so the, um, the, um, the literal or the plain sense it is not the uh, only way in which these texts can be read. Uh, so I, I, I think a, a spiritual reading of these texts is important. Um, and I think we see a lot of that going on in the Gospels and in the letters of Paul. Um, and I, I think this should be continued in our own Christian reception of the law. Professor Sondreger, if I may, a question from the audience that I think uh, ties in here it's, uh, from a professor here at Trinity. Uh, he says, a grounding of the doctrine of the Trinity in the self-offering of God as found in Levitical cultists might find an augmentation in what some consider the height of Christian cultists, the doctrine of the Eucharist. Can one find similar Trinitarian foundations within the self-offering of Christ in the Eucharist? I, um, thank you for that question. And I, I do, um, I do have in mind that the Eucharist is sacrificial. Um, now that it's certainly um, uh, not without controversy in a Christian tradition, um, but I, I do think that the, the life of Christ um, is it, itself sacrificial. Um, I, I think, um, in fact, I, I um, am attempting to work out now in this um, um, draft leading up to volume three, the way in which the hypostatic union is, is a mode of sacrifice, um, that the, the human nature of Christ is being reduced to ash, um, and it, and that that is the um, the self offering of um, the Father and the Son. That it is um, it is um, enacted in, in the cross and um, the return and exaltation in the in the rising of the sun and that is what the eucharist is is this dying and rising uh, this um, showing forth christ's death until he come and um and so in in that way i think sacrifice it's not everything um in eucharist and of course, there, there are expansive motifs of, of manna, of feeding, of, um, of assembly, but I think the, the molten heart of Eucharist is sacrifice. I'll insert another question from the audience that um, I think lingers behind both volumes and came up in some of the responses that we've already published. Um, someone asks, could Dr. Sondra Egger talk a little bit about her doctrine of scripture, particularly the claim that scripture is a distillate of God's being, which you say on page 68 of this second volume. Mm -hmm. Nicely said, um, with a, a footnote to boot. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think of scripture, um, I, I'd love to have a um, as part of our week-long seminar um, a, a whole day dedicated to this topic. Um, I th I think scripture is a creature, um, and it has a creaturely properties. Um, I'm I'm a, a fallibilist in in scripture, and I think this is part of my understanding of scripture as as mortal as as a um, as a creature uh, that is um, born of the earth earthy, um, but it is a a wholly redeemed creature. It it has been. That's why I say it's strongly unique. It's it's unique not 
not simply because uh, no other book is it, but it is strongly unique um, because it, God has uh, fully redeemed this creature to be the place where we encounter God. Um, that, that's what I mean by, by God being manifest there. So it's a, it's a distillate in, in this sense that we're, um, we're seeing not simply um, God's acts toward us. This is this theme of compatibilism that, um, that many of the panelists discuss so well in their comments. It, uh, scripture is not simply the record of God with us. It, it is also that, that uh, God's very life is laid down in the, the sinews of this text. Uh, that's why we encounter God there. Um, that, that requires a, a spiritual reading of this text. It, it, um, but this is why I think um, the fathers can, can read um, Israel's scripture as a discussion about the eternal generation of the son. It's not, these texts are not treating the incarnate word they're, they're treating the, the full, equal um, generation and uh, dignity of the sun. And they can do that, I think, because God is present there. I have a qu question quickly. Professor Sonderegger, I wondered if you'd speak just a little bit more about your renovation of the vestigium and what role you think these play in Trinitarian doctrine. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just, I, I um, ruthlessly cut that out of my initial um, presentations. I thought, um, stick to the main points. But, um, but I do think the Trinity needs intellectual justification and warrant in our um, present world. It, it has been treated as Christian speech that is filled with arcana um, and technical terminology, um, that it is, um, it is just this odd burden that Christians have been um, asked to carry. Um, and um, for that reason, no one really wants to talk about it or preach about it um, or handle it in um, catechism and Sunday school um, because you're constantly making some kind of heretical statement and all your analogies are tritheistic or modalistic or crypto sabellian or something. Uh, um, so, um, so as a result, uh, the doctrine of Trinity has become this interior treasure that is um, buried in the field. It, it's, it's still just sitting there in the field. Um, now, I, I think um, one of the, the remedies for this is that we say um, because Trinity is concerned with the reality of God and therefore with uh, the most real being, that uh, Trinity is a kind of metaphysics. It's a, it's a metaphysical discussion of being. And, and therefore some of the uh, the deep um, problematics in metaphysics that we're seeing, um, I, I suggest in some of the feminist metaphysics, um, but, it, but clearly also in questions in philosophy of mind, um, also questions about the um, 
uh, status and goodness of being itself, the problem of universals, uh, the problem of individuation at, as we see in the schoolmen. Um, these are, are echoes, what I call a uh, vestigia or in another kind of Wittgensteinian mode, a, a problem in the neighborhood. Um, and I'm hoping it's another case where, um, as, as Fred suggested earlier, another case where, where we would hear secular philosophers talk about these metaphysical problems. And they uh, might say, all right, uh, I, I can't affirm Trinity, say, um, but I can see they're working with some of these same problems. I, I can see this is, this is uh, an attempt to, to take on the problem of universals, the relation of the um, uh, concrete to the particular, uh, about um, individuation, uh, about just what um, identity is. Um, and, and this, I think, is part of the, the uh, broad public intellectual dignity of the Trinity. I think that you even mentioned there was an apologetic, um, was it instinct? Right, right. I, I didn't want this to be a, a full apologia, um, but I, I did want it to be uh, the case where um, someone recognizes a kinship. I, I, I wanted that family resemblance, that, that sense that, that you say, mm, okay, I, th I'm, I, I don't really know what I think about this idea of Trinity, but I, I can see when you start thinking profoundly about individuation, you're you're in this territory, and this this is the kind of thing that Christians are worried about when they're talking about um, persons um, being identical yet distinct from the nature. I think that was terribly exciting. I love that part. Of that. Uh, thank you. It was it was a discovery for me. I just you know this is. Um, uh, if anything's going to throw me out of the um, Karl Barth Society of North America, I think this is it. You know, I uh, I think there are plenty of people who wonder about Barth's idea about the uh, obedience, the eternal obedience of the Son. But you know, getting close to apologetics, it, even at this kind of ten foot pole way that I tried to do it, that's yeah, that's pretty um, heretical that's and, and yeah. Bardian circle. So I just um, thank you, Bardians, for still speaking to me. Well, panelists, continue to feel free to um, step in as you wish. For now, I'll raise another question, and and I'd like to hear multiple people comment on this if you'd like. Um, the worry is about whether a departure from the language of persons is a point of departure from one of our few remaining ecumenical points of unity between Eastern Roman and Protestant uh, confessions of faith. And so I'm just curious if, if any of you would like to comment on, on that worry. Good, I, I'll, I'll start, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. It, I, I, I wanna underscore, I, I'm a, a priest of the church. I, I affirm the traditional um, dogma of Trinity. I, I don't want this to be a, um, a doctrine that um, breaks faith with the um, ecumene. Um, uh, and I do have a whole section on persons, but as the panelists note, there's more on procession, many more words on procession than on persons. But that part of that is because um, person is going to be more fully developed in the missions uh, that is in the volume coming up, which I also consider to be a volume on the Trinity. So I'm, I'm, I'm not 
done with this, but I, I don't want this to be a uh, procession rather than person. It's that the processions are understood. Um, I, I try a little foray into some um, uh, modern mathematics it, as infinite sets, that this is what the persons are. Um, and um, and I, I want to affirm uh, that there are uh, three persons in the Godhead um, and that the processional life is the way in which we understand what the persons are. I think that's very clear in the book that there's no departure here from uh, basic Trinitarian orthodoxy. Um, I, I would note that I think there's some really ecumenical things about your project. Um, if we're thinking about what unites us across Protestantism, Catholicism, and and uh, the Orthodox, um, though I think I noted in my review that I love that you're um, happy to be Latin. Um, uh, there are also okay. some really deep resonances with the East um, uh, in your description of the Father's origin, for instance. Um, so I think there's a lot of ecumenical space here uh, for conversation. Yeah, thank you. I, I do. Um, this is the other part of, of tradition. I, I consider myself one under authority. Uh, and the, uh, the tradition had, lays claim on me. And I uh, certainly the, um, the, the first um, seven councils, I, I think, are um, are uh, binding on me, and I am to find a way to speak faithfully um, to them and out of them. Um, I, I do want to defend the filioque um, under these these um, different idioms. Me too. That's so fun and unstylish. It's great. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm I'm with you there, Beth. I just I think. Yeah, I, I I just think Augustine got this one right, and um, and I think we should just um, I I think you know where uh, Congar it says um, that the, the um, many of the uh, Greek Orthodox have ways of speaking that are consistent with this, I um, and that Augustine himself. Um, had received a, a good number of, of Greek influences um, in North Africa, this uh, and in in Milan. Um, this, I think, uh, makes a rapprochement much more possible. Yeah. Well, uh, looking at sort of where Trinitarianism went in the 20th century. Uh, pretty strong social Trinitarianism became so plausible um, that thinking well about the unity of God um, was really put off, you know, to we can get to that later, or we might not get to that. Bruce Marshall has written well about how the, you know, the locus on the unity of God just utterly withered, especially in Catholic theology, but I would say even more so in Protestant theology. And so going back to the, the question of, um, you know, what, isn't there an ecumenical danger in putting off discussion of persons or refusing to talk about persons? To come back to that and say, well, Zondereger volume two does affirm persons in the Trinity and distinctions among the persons in the Trinity, but she gets at it. You come at it so much from the starting point in monotheism and of Trinity as a, a statement within a real actual monotheism. Um, that's, that's what I view as so helpful here, even when I'm still standoffish about, I don't know if I can affirm some of the things in here, but it is so helpful to have a counterweight on the current theological scene um, over against the sort of robust, evident, apparent uh, plausibility of social Trinitarianism, that there's mm -hmm. at least someone out there on the market who's coming at it from such an angle that you think, yeah, you're never going to get to like three people in the Godhead. This is never going to get full on social with these kinds of starting points that you've staked out. Mm. I, you know, you can see why social Trinitarianism um, became 
um, popular and dominant, uh, particularly in, in Protestant circles. But I, I think I would take uh, Catherine Lacuna also to be a, a Catholic exemplar of that school. It, it, you know, it, it is a, an attempt to make the, the Trinity relevant to Christian life as Karl Rahner counseled um, and to see it as an expression of our own salvation and, um, and a, a way in which we ground our own Christian practice in the reality of God. Um, those, those are our uh, laudable aims. I, I think the, um, the danger is exactly what you say, Fred. It, it just, um, well, I, it, to um, speak about it um, more, more polemically, it, it, it just has mythological dimensions where where it's as though we have we we have these three divine beings and then they're going to agree with each other or they're they're going to find common cause or or they're going to um, be really really close to each other um, and this this is standard mythological talk and I think um, uh, the the Shema Israel um, counsels us away from this, and I, I think that is the central witness um, in in the theophany to Moses, and I, I think we are we are bound by that, and so Trinity has to be an expression of a recognition that. Um, our God is one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience, Dr. Sonderegger. Uh, Christians often tend to conflate the Levitical and Passover sacrificial traditions, which our colleagues in biblical scholarship remind us are importantly different. Can you say more about why you emphasize the Levitical tradition in particular and what role, if any, Passover theologies have in what you're doing in your project? Mm, lovely, lovely question. Um, uh, let me, uh, before I um, dilate on that, it, it, is it starting to look like I'm in the witness protection uh, program? Is it getting kind of um, dull on my face here? I can uh, close my blinds. I think you're okay for now. Okay. okay, because uh, sometimes I have to uh, close those blinds because it, it, it looks like I'm in an undisclosed location, you know. Um, so just, just uh, uh, post me when, when it, it looks um, completely implausible that I'm speaking to you as a free citizen. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I try to read Leviticus and Exodus together. As, um, as reflecting one another, um, but at, a, at different hinge points. So, so I, I take uh, Jacob Milgram to be uh, the, the great teacher here that, um, that the atonement um, uh, and festal calendar of Israel is a, a, a resonance of the, um, the giving of the law and the apostasy of the golden calf. So we're, we're getting sacrifice um, uh, parallel with the um, disclosure of the law and with the um, the alien fire that that um, defiles the um, sanctuary, with the apostasy of the golden calf, and that the uh, uh, festal calendar um, uh, highlighted in the um, day of atonement is an 
is an outworking of that parallel. Now, I think um, the Passover tradition in Exodus it is clearly one that is um, part of the important um, uh, narrative moment uh, in Exodus where the people Israel are formed in this liberative moment and in the encounter with God in the wilderness, um, the, the great book of Numbers. Um, another, um, in my view, another un underused, underread um, book. I, um, as a parenthetic remark, in, in, in my church, I think we have uh, one reading from Numbers in our common lectionary. Um, so uh, that tradition, I think, is to be uh, properly understood and reflected upon in the um, self-offering of the sun. And I, I think um, my, my sense now is that in this third volume that the uh, central book from the Torah for the missions of the Son and the Spirit will be Exodus. Um, and particularly this, this encounter of death and life um, where, where the Lord God passes through Egypt at night. Um, these, I, I think, will be the, the centerpiece of the missions of God. Can I, I want to draw a question up out of the Q&A box that I saw, and I think it's related to that. Um, a couple of people asked, and I wondered this too, whether you've really succeeded in having a manifestation of the processional life of God that is not economically disclosed, mm -hmm. if what you're looking at is, you know, covenant arranged uh, presence of God in the cultus. So to yeah. use John Webster's, you know, way of framing it, um, you're not doing uh, divine perfection. Aren't you already in looking at the fiery sacrifice doing presence to yeah, good, good, um, and, good. But it's not missions. You're talking about doing missions via Exodus, the next volume. But aren't you already doing something economic in another sense in this volume? Yeah, very nice, very nice. So that uh, that really um, raises this this question about uh, what we're reading in Scripture, I, and I think this is a, a a fundamental question about the um, the reach, the, the depth, uh, the force of this text. I, um, of course, I'm, I'm reading texts that um, in their, their manifest um, uh, content are about God's ways with Israel. I, I think there's, there's no question about that. So this, this has been taken to be um, in the Fathers a part of the discussion of the divine dispensation, uh, or um, as it came to be um, viewed in the modern period, the economic trinity uh, that you've written so well on, Fred. I, um, um, my claim is that that is not everything that scripture is doing. Uh, I, and this is what a metaphysical um, spiritual reading of scripture amounts to. This is what the intelligible laid down in the concrete amounts to. Uh, and it is an outworking of this fundamental compatibilist view that I tried to lay out in volume one is that it is possible to know God as such in our concepts and words. 
Now, if this is so, I, and I take that to be a primitive and, and cannot, uh, an unanalyzable primitive. So it, it simply is an axiom that stands at the, the root of um, Christian confession as I see it. Um, if, if God can make himself known as such, um, in this creature of Holy Scripture. Uh, we can read Scripture not only as the dispensation, but also um, as the um, manifestation of the processional life and the uh, uh, terminus in the persons, the, the triune life of God. Now that has to be governed I think by uh, I appeal to Lateran four here that that every form of likeness is enclosed by an ever greater unlikeness, and that this just is the the engine the the movement of the processional life of God is forging this ever greater transcendence, uh, this um, uh, this. Uh, magnificence that escapes all of our uh, likenesses. So, um, so I I think we have to we have to dare speaking about God's own life out of Scripture um, and not say, uh, well, this is this is God. Uh, God with us only. It is that, but it is not that only. Another question from the audience, Dr. Sunderegger. Um, if we can use fire for analogy without collapsing into modalism, why could we not use a social or ecclesial analogy, as in John 17, without collapsing into something like social Trinitarianism? So again, a question with the footnote, uh, pages 323 and 324 of your volume. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't want to say um, that uh, John 17, you know, that that David Ford is so wonderfully developed as the centerpiece of the Gospel of John. I, I don't want to say that those images um, cannot or should not be used. I, I think um, the, the task here uh, is to speak of the um, scriptural material, the, the biblical witness in such a way that we are led to contemplate the uh, life of God himself. Um, and and what, what happens often when we uh, come to passages like um, like John 17. I think often the Great Commission is used this way. Um, sometimes the Pauline letters um, they it they are read as though um, uh, what we must learn there is that God has come under our, our roof as it incarnate flesh um, in the spirit and that we uh, reflect on um, Christ as the incarnate word as, um, as the soul means by which we think God and that that uh, has entailed in it that the uh, incarnation takes place at a certain time and extends for a certain 
number of years and that the spirit is outpoured or breathed upon the disciples by the risen Lord. Um, and that these are two distinct realities uh, that then are to be um, discussed and reflected on and in some way tied to the uh, Father of Lights. And these, we say, are, are one um, because um, because they are all doing the Father's will, say. I, um, my, my claim instead is that we read all these texts, um, including Leviticus, uh, as speaking of the uh, dispensation um, in the New Testament of the missions, um, but they are um, at their depths, a manifestation of the inner life of God. Okay, panelists, I want to give you uh, one more chance to ask anything that we haven't been able to cover yet. I do share the sentiment that this could be a week-long seminar. Um, so let me open the floor one more time to you guys uh, to, to close this out, if anyone has something. I have a question that I hope won't be is uh, won't lapse into a week long seminar in itself. <laughs> when I was writing my response, I was rereading John Webster as uh, I want to do, and mm -hmm. I was surprised. I was actually surprised by something he'd said on the place. It's in his essay, "The Place of Christology." In yeah, that's um, an interesting essay of his, isn't it? Yes, yeah. and it, and he quite he surprised me with his response, and and it in conjunction with what you'd written, it was forcing me to do some uh, conceptual lifting and, and thinking that I thought I wasn't going to have to. Uh, could you unpack that a little bit though? What is the role then in Christology? You'd mentioned this a little, or what is the role of Christology in Trinitarian reflection? Um, and, uh, and how are you kind of relating your project to Webster's work and his legacy? Yeah, I just, um, you know, I, I deeply, grieve and, and mourn uh, John Webster's um, death. It's just um, uh, such a loss to theology and to all of us who, who knew him and had a chance to work or study with him. Um, I, I think my own sense is that John um, was, was moving in the uh, course of his life from, um, from his um, interest in Jungle uh, and um, through Jungle into Bart into the Protestant scholastics and then into Thomas. And I think that essay on Christology is a marker of his, his worry that Christology has become outsized, uh, has done more work than it should do in theology, um, and that there needs to be a, a kind of correction here, um, particularly in Protestant dogmatics. Um, and I, uh, I, I've taken that as a, um, as a, a signal uh, from John that I should forge ahead here. Um, I, uh, I think um, Christology needs to be drawn back into Trinity. It, it has, it has um, been allowed, I think, especially under the extreme pressure of the, um, uh, historical research into the life of Jesus into a, a separate domain where we um, perhaps talk about the, the person and the hypostatic union, but we're, we're really trying to, um, to take account of the 
um, historical milieu, the particularity, the individuality of the man Jesus, and then square that with traditional dogmatic teachings um, issuing out of Chalcedon. Um, and I, I think uh, this, this deforms Christology. It, it, it makes it um, nearly impossible to, um, to reflect on the, the principal theme, which is God with us. Um, that this is the, uh, the word uh, agenitos sarx, becoming flesh. Um, and this is a Trinitarian confession. And I take the early church to be reading the debates about Christology, what we call Christology, to be Trinitarian debates. And that this is why Chalcedon ends with that peroration on Nicaea, as the Holy Fathers always taught. Um, and I, uh, so my aim here is to make uh, pneumatology and Christology um, modern idioms of the Trinitarian missions and to think about the eternal uh, processional life of God terminating in a temporal mission, uh, as Thomas puts this. And so Christology would be a further reflection on the, um, uh, the personal life of God. Okay, well, I'm sorry to say that for now, uh, our time has come to an end. Let me express uh, our deep gratitude to all of you, especially Professor Sondreger. It's been such a gift to host this and a rich conversation. Uh, my apologies, especially to audience members uh, whose questions I didn't get the chance to raise. There were many good ones even coming in at the end. Uh, so perhaps we'll have to run this back sometime soon or certainly once, once volume three arrives. Um, in the meantime, let me remind everyone that there is a written symposium published uh, you can find it on our website and there's a lot of rich uh, reading to to do and to meditate upon so um, for now uh, we wish you all well and go in peace <laughs>